morning, everyone. Glad you can all make it here. It was very stormy. When my mom asked me why I was leaving the house this early, <laughs> I was like, you're actually going to church today? And I was like, I'm going to have to do worship, so I guess I'm kind of here. Yeah. Um, it's also cool. We actually have everyone in this house. I think we just <laughs> feel like we should orient the speakers to make room. Yeah. Yeah. How's everyone doing? Okay week? Good? Yeah. Good to see everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this has been a very, I don't know, stressful? Not stressful. It's been a rough two months. I think this is the week that I kind of finally hit me. Like kind of everything that's been kind of going on. But you know, thank you for the church for praying for family last week. But I, I feel like even in prepping this worship set, we we posture this entire week has just been grace that is enough every single day. And I think learning and finding a God in there, that there is a God who is good, no matter the circumstances. So even though it's rainy and really cold and stormy right now, and kind of feels like in life right now, it's very stormy. <clears throat> I think that's the place where God can break in and do new things and do good work. Yeah. And so I think even just for me, preaching to myself this morning, just holding on to that promise that he is good, yeah, that he loves us deeply, and that he is moving and he is still doing good things. So I'm going to open us in worship. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then, yeah, we can worship together. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, God, we're gathered here on a, <clears throat> on a rainy, stormy day, Father. Lord, in the midst of, yeah, God, a lot of storms in our own lives going on. God, Lord, needing and holding on to that reminder that you are good, that you are Lord, that you love us deeply, and that you're coming again, Father. And so, God, even as we just have this time in worship, Lord, um, yeah, in this little space in the middle of San Jose, Lord, in the middle of a storm when I think so many of us, Lord, just imagine just being holed up at home, God. We are gathered in this place for you, Father. And so, God, would your spirit come into this space? God, will your presence be here strongly among us, God? That in this little place in the middle of the Silicon Valley, Lord, there will be just a little remnant, Father. Lord, an upper room, Lord, where your presence dwells and moves powerfully. And so be with us. Come into this place. We invite you into this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Please stand if you're able. Let's worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness.
together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Today's scripture reading comes from Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. So please read, please read alongside me. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I realized when prepping for this to uh, this is on the lectionary, and I realized that every single time I read the lectionary, I have a tendency to pick Isaiah verses, but specifically Isaiah verses from chapter 40 onwards. I know Pastor Sebastian preached a sermon series on Isaiah, but mostly the first half, a couple of months, it was um, like, a year ago. like a year ago. Yeah, like a year ago. And I'm realizing more and more why I'm drawn to this section of Isaiah is that this is God speaking to those who are in exile, right? It's speaking a word of hope and comfort to those who are mourning. And I'm realizing too that, I don't know, this has been a really weird week, especially for me in worship. Um, every single time I feel like I enter the presence of God, I just feel like crying this week. And I'm realizing more and more that like, there is something different about this kind of grieving. It's the tears of the Lord, right? It's understanding God's heart for those things that are broken and bearing and crying alongside them, realizing that even in exile, we are not in a place of power where our own efforts or abilities can change or do anything, right? but we're in a posture where we are just grieving with the Lord over the state of the world and letting him move and letting him be the one who is in control. Right? And so even these Isaiah verses right, that speak to a people in exile, right, that promise of hope given to those who have no hope any longer, right? there is such a, there's such a beauty there because we're at the place where we can't do anything and we have to rely on the Lord. He has to be the one. The next one is Hosanna. Right? And I remember the line in here, right? Break my heart before it breaks yours. I feel like as we're at church on mission this year, right? before even necessarily thinking about what we're going to do or where we're going to move or anything like that, it's our heart posture that matters the most. Right? And so to have the heart of the Lord, to grieve over the things that are broken in this world, right? break my heart before it breaks yours. It's a dangerous prayer. But I think it's a prayer that is really powerful and moves the spirit and moves the Lord. So yeah, I haven't played this. Glenn usually leads the song, <laughs> so I'm realizing when we were practicing, it's a little rough, but we'll get there. So join me.
coming and braving the weather to come here and be a church family with us today. Thank you. Um, and I think that what Chris shared with his heart, um, something that I resonated with as well, whenever he spent time in the presence of the Lord, as he, he felt the tears of his uh, I, I come just being honest because I'm pretty traumatized when I look at my own success. Um, and I recognize that not only do uh, we come together to, to celebrate and to rejoice, but we also come together to mourn. We come together to suffer and, sh and bear each other's burdens. Um, and so the duality of that is, is not lost on me this morning. Uh, the storm's outside, the storm's in our hearts, right, as Chris mentioned. Um, but as we come together, no matter what our circumstances are, that doesn't change. In good times, bad times, valleys, mountains, that never changes and that will never fail us. And so whether you're in a place, the valley of the shadow of death, tears of the saints, whatever it is, you could be on the mountaintop. You're like, I love rain. <laughs> we need it. Whatever it is, that doesn't change. And so no matter what you're going through, uh, whether you've had a terrible start to the year or whether this year is awesome, we look collectively, we say, hey, look, look at what Jesus has done for us. Look at how much our God loves us. Look at how he has saved us. And let that be our anchor in the storm. And so I can't go there right now because the table <laughs> won't let me. But you can just imagine I'm holding the bread, the bread that represents the body of Christ. So this is the body of, uh, this is the bread broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. Um, every time you eat the bread, drink the cup, you celebrate Christ's death and resurrection from now until he comes again. And so receive this peace, receive the anchor, receive the hope that you can find at the table. When you feel ready, come and share this communion.
Grand table will remain open for the rest of the service, but if you're able, please stand for one last song.
I do love how you're in the midst of exile, uh, the imagery that you give your people in the midst of you coming on the clouds, mm. out of a hope and a victory that cannot be defeated. Mm. Lord, you guys, you read in the scripture reading this morning, Lord, that we will soar on wings like eagles with you, right? And so, Lord, even as we gather in this place in the middle of a very stormy and very cold day, God, um, Lord, just think of that image in Revelations, God, everyone around your throne is singing hallelujah to the Lamb who is slain. So, God, give us a hope that the victory is assured, but a hope that cannot be shaken because the grave is empty. So be with us, God. Break every chain. Heal every broken thing. God, make everything new again. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I take a seat, say hi to someone next to you.
Thank you, Chris. Thank you, worship team. May God give you peace and, uh, and to everyone else as well. I'm glad you're here this morning and um, you braved the storm. Sometimes, sometimes it's just wise to stay home. It's okay for those who are at home. Um, I, was at, I did Mission Peak twice this week. It was a little muddy on Thursday. Um, I was the only one at the top at the time. <laughs> um, but I'm learning because I have another John Muir Trail segment this summer. And so learning to um, assess risk is very important. It can be life or death sometimes, you know, when, it, when you're out in the mountains and crossing rivers and things. So it's okay for those who had to be at home today. Better to be safe and alive. In, in, in backpacking, there's a saying, the mountain will always be there. <laughs> so, I don't know how that applies to church, but, you know, something must be similar. Um, let me start off with uh, this question. If the Bible were an app, how would you categorize it, right? There's different categories of apps in the um, app store, right? Would it be uh, a utility Right? It could be social networking, <laughs> um, health and fitness, education, lifestyle. Now, it could be one of these, um, but the Bible is many things, and the Bible, in, and that's the subject that I want to talk to you about, but I want to put it in the perspective of, of this. Um, how would non Christians outside the church generally regard the Bible? And for those of you know, us who, if you've talked to family or friends, coworkers about Christianity or about, about the Bible, what have they said about the Bible? Right? Um, some people are say it's hyperbolic, meaning it's exaggerated, irrelevant, outdated, full of errors. Not true. Right? Have you heard, have, has anybody heard anybody say that about the Bible? I mean, most of you, right? Um, well, how would Christ, what do Christians say about the Bible? Well, many Christians say the same thing, or maybe think about the same thing. Hey, that story seems exaggerated. I don't know if I can believe in that miracle. Or, you know, this passage seems irrelevant. Or this teaching seems outdated. You know, aren't there some errors in, you know, the Bible? Or this doesn't seem very useful to me today. So what I want to do this morning is, uh, well, actually, these two next two messages today and next month is talk about the Bible as the Word of God uh, for us and to, to, to give you some reasons why we believe that it's true, giving you some internal evidence and external evidence that I'll talk about a little bit today and more next week. But I want to put this in the context of the Bible is something, is the foundation of what we believe, who we are, how we come to, be, how we come to believe and know God. Now, I want to give you the kind of the ground level of why we believe that is true. But in this retreat that I'm coming to in April, I want to give you from our theme in Philippians, the bigger picture of how is it that we live our life in an everyday life with the Bible that we have. So in these next couple weeks, I want to kind of give you the questions and challenges and doubts that you might have, but many people outside of the church who are not Christians have about the Bible, that it's irrelevant, that it's outdated, that it's not true, that it's errors. Kind of refute these things to help us to have a firm foundation of what we believe as the Word of God and then to see in the bigger picture of things, well, how is it that you live your life? And what is it that you base your life on? Which we would say the Bible. But I want to make that connection from in, during the retreat, but I want to begin in the next couple of weeks about with the truth of the Bible. All right. So I want to use these, this, these five points, and I'm probably only going to do four of them today. Um, as my outline. What does the Bible say about the Bible? Um, this is not exhaustive. I'm just going to give you a few points about what the Bible says. 
And really what I want to say is, what I want to use there is four friends of mine, and it's probably going to be three today, four friends who have said these things about the Bible, who have doubts and who have questions and really big challenges and barriers for them regarding the faith. And what I want to say about this, using this as an outline, is to address their questions and their doubts and to help us to make the connection of how do we, why do we believe in this book as the Word of God and how do we make the connection of then living it out in our lives. So uh, what does the Bible say about the Bible? Just five quick points today. God breathed, Christ-centered, that is true, that is enough, it is eternal. All right, the first, the Bible is God breathed. This passage is an important passage, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul gives us this about the Bible. So the Bible's, you know, basically saying what the Bible is. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I have a friend, we'll just call him Peter, that's not his name, but we'll just call him Peter. He grew up in the Catholic Church and he stopped going to church as a child. And today in his 50s, he's coming back to his faith. He's not quite there yet, but he's beginning to explore again the faith of his childhood with the help of actually family who are Christians. Now, currently he still says or still thinks that along his journey, right? remember there's, there's a journey that the Bible, Bible is exaggerated, it's hyperbolic, that these miracles are just exaggerated. You know, how can a mountain be moved, right? Um, and he thinks that the Bible is, in places, irrelevant, outdated. Now, he thinks that the Bible is written by human beings and it was exaggerated. Now, the first part is true, that it was written by human beings. And I think that's something that we need to acknowledge and examine what that means. Right? God didn't simply drop a book in someone's lap and said, this is the word of God. Right? God breathed life into people to write the word of God. Uh, so what we know about the Bible is that human beings were, we might say, inspired as God breathed into them. Uh, and human beings wrote this, these books, but they did not invent it, and that's a big difference. And so to say that human beings wrote the Bible is one thing, but to say that human beings invented the Bible is another. Uh, God breathed life into s over 40 authors, over 1,500 years, right? Um, the works, the words that he wanted to give them. Uh, let me just ask, what is harder to prove then? I mean, going back to this, what is harder to prove that God dropped a book like the Bible into someone's lap or that God gave the message that he wanted to give to 40 different, over 40 different authors over 1,500 years, a unified message. Right? And that's something to discuss with someone who considers the Bible, well, it's written by humans, it's flawed, it's got errors, it must be not real. Right? What is more believable, that God just dropped a book into someone's lap, or that he inspired and gave the words to over 40 authors, over 1,500 years, these 66 books, right? We have Isaiah the prophet, we have Ezra a priest, we have Matthew a tax collector, John was a fisherman, Paul was a religious leader, a Pharisee, Moses was a shepherd, Luke was a physician, a doctor, right? All of these different people were chosen to record or to uh, give the words of God that would be for us. Now, I want to introduce two words to you, internal and external evidence, and give you a brief introduction. I'll talk a little bit more about it next week. Um, when people look at the idea of the Bible, whether it's true or not, 
you can look at it from a secular perspective. When people look at certain literature at any time in history, you know, whether that literature is actually true or not. And there are different criteria of looking at it. Um, we call that internal evidence. A few of those things regarding the Bible is unity. Unity is, well, do the, is the message from one book to another and all the way through basically the same message? Or is it just completely the opposite? Now, the early church fathers, they decided in the first few hundred years of, after Jesus, of the early church, to compile the books that we call the Bible. Um, they looked at different literature. There's other gospels according to Thomas, gospel according to Peter. There's all these other pieces of literature that were written by people and that are questionable. They don't quite fit the Gospels that we have, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so they never made it into the Bible, what we call the Bible. And so this unity is important to see, well, is the message from Genesis to Revelation really the same message? And when you look at that unity, it is amazing to see not only the fulfillment of prophecy, but the unity of, of what God was revealing to us in the Bible from, through, this, through 66 books. Prophecy said and fulfilled. There are prophecies that were fulfilled in hundreds of years to over a thousand years. The reliability of the manuscripts. In every kind of literature in history, you have manuscripts, which means the original person, which you think what well, we know of the original person, author, wrote this book, or like Homer. And then we have copies of it. We may not have the original copy, and most, for most of literature, we don't have original copies of things. But we have copies and copies and copies, which is the best we have in literature. So you can't throw away out all literature just because you say, oh, we don't have the original. Well, mo most of history, we don't have the original, but we have copies and copies and copies. Well, how reliable are these copies when you compare the copies and copies? Because if we had 10 people here copy, let's just say, the book of Genesis, we would probably have a pretty fair, a reliable um, source here, 10 different copies of the original. You, I'm sure you'll do a pretty good job and it'll be very accurate. Well, we can compare those things and say, yeah, that's, that's pretty true. But when you get, look over hundreds, even a thousand, even 2,000 years of copies and copies of the Old Testament, then you begin to realize these copies are pretty reliable. They're pretty accurate. All right, that's internal evidence. And then the last is like one of them is just the number of manuscripts. And I'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. So could the Bible be pieced together and fabricated? Because I think that's something that people will look at. Well, it's easy in hindsight to put something together. Um, and how, but the question really is how likely is it that someone did that? So yes, it is possible. Anything is possible. But how probable is it, right? How likely is it that people piece together uh, the Bible? So if any of you or if any of you have friends who think about this, there, is lots of, there are lots of good reading that's not too difficult that speak of the internal evidence of the Bible and how that it's true. So to my friend Peter who says the Bible is exaggerated, it's hyperbolic, it's um, irrelevant, it's outdated. Well, there's, we can have some discussion about that. We can look at the Bible itself. We can look at the unity of the Bible. We can look at uh, not just theologians, but historians who are not necessarily Christians who look at the Bible as a piece of literature and, and view it in terms of, is this reliable? Is it a unified message? We can have good conversations about those things. The second point I want to make about, about the Bible or what the Bible says about itself is that it is true. Now, that may not be a, a big point to you or it's like that, of course, it's true. But the Bible says that about itself over and over. Jesus said that. Psalm 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. 
Now, that's actually a big claim to make, that the word of God is right and true. Why is that? Well, I could say the 49ers are going to win the Super Bowl next Sunday. I guarantee it. I can't believe it. We got some people shaking their heads. All right? I could say the 49ers are going to win the Super Bowl. I guarantee it. Now, I can say whatever I want, but to back it up, right, in advance, that's difficult. To make a claim that the Word of God is right and it is true, you need to back it up because it's not just one story that it's talking about. It's talking about 66 books, 1,500 years spread out of literature, of history, the names, the dates. There's a lot of detail in the Bible. And to say that it's right, that it's true, that's a pretty big claim. Let me get into this a little bit more. So historians have accused Christianity not to be true, that the Bible not to be true, because they cannot find certain names and cities that were mentioned. And there are many. And this is what's great about the Bible. There's so much detail in the Bible. So, for example, the Hittites in the Bible. Who are the Hittites? Well, um, many people thought that they were made up. They could not find their name. They could not find their cities. There was no evidence before the 1800s. Now, 1800s might seem a long time ago from, from, for us, but in relative history, that's not that long ago. So 1,800 years from the you know, New Testament church to then, 1,800 years, Christians were saying, yeah, the Hittites, they're in the Bible. But other people were saying, uh, we don't have any evidence that there were Hittites in history. We don't have a city. We don't have anything. But in the 1830s, a discovery of this, what we, they call the city of Nesha was found in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, in the area of Cappadocia. If you go out to Cappadocia, it's one of the best places to go in Turkey, do the air, uh, the air balloon ride. We did it as a family. The Hittite civilization was found. They found, uncovered eventually, an entire city in tablets, they found over 10,000 tablets. Let me get this right. Right, 10,000 tablets that recorded, right, their history in the Hittites. And what, what historians know today is that the, the height of the Hittite empire was around 1,300 years before Jesus. Ten, over 10,000 tablets, a civilization, a city that was discovered and before 1830s, people thought, eh, this is a made-up people group. We know nothing about them, right? All right. Number, second example. When you look at Genesis 14, right, um, there's, there are a ton of names of places, right, of cities in what we would call current day uh, Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, right? There are a ton of names in Genesis 14. Well, for almost 2,000 years as well, people thought these were all made up cities. They, we, do have, we do not have any archaeological evidence. We have no evidence that these cities ever existed. And there are a ton of these. Until 1970s. The Ebla tablets were found in northern Syria, more than 15,000 clay tablets from around 2300 BC. And on these tablets were the names and places, many of them found in the Bible from the time of Genesis 14. Right? Not until the 1970s, people thought these were made up. We have no evidence. So when you read your Bible and you're like wading through all of these boring names, names that you cannot pronounce, right? 
thinking that the Bible is not relevant to our lives today. All of these city names, they give evidence to truth. These cities existed. People lived in these places. They had wars. And it was not until, the, in this example, the 1970s that they discovered the names of these cities that were in Genesis 14. We had them all along. Right? So, why is that important? Um, Jesus commented, your, your word is truth. John 17, 17. Another claim that the Bible is true, right? That your word is truth. So my friend, another friend, I'll call him Bill. He's the empirical guy. He calls himself, I'm an empiricist. I need numbers. I need proof. Well, um, I do too. I think many of you who have that personality trait, who have that mindset, it's like, I need numbers, right? I need empiricism to prove that something is true. Um, even Doubting Thomas in our story of Doubting Thomas who needed to see and touch Jesus. I will not believe until I see and touch Jesus myself, right? He needed evidence. He needed proof. So um, God gives us these names and cities and in the Bible and you know it's up to people to finally discover them and decide, well, okay, so these might be true. But for us, the word of God is more than just, okay, these cities were real. Okay, these events might have happened. They are God's word and they are truth. They are life to us. Right? They are an application in us to, for us that is important. And this is what the ap- what, why this matters in talking about the Bible. Um, For those who don't believe it's true, they will never consider it applicable, relevant to their life. But for you, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, that gives life, that gives hope, that gives peace, that gives meaning, right? That gives us life itself. Then the application of this, of God's word, is tremendously meaningful. Um... Coming down to the street level, just a couple weeks ago, our, our, our friends of ours who have kids who are in elementary school, um, they were at, talking to me and Priscilla. They said, um, their son, who we've known for a long time, he's, he's strong-headed and crafty. Right? And they said, um, what do, you, do you have any advice or opinions about handling this situation where our, our son is you know, strong-headed and crafty? And I was just saying, you know, I was wondering to myself, hmm, I wonder where he gets this from. You know, (laughs) mom, dad, teacher at school, (laughs) you know, right? Um, Children follow parents. I mean, when you're young, that's all you know. You follow your parents. Now, we all know that and believe theologically that children inherit the sinful nature that we all have. And so they will do their own thing because they have this sinful nature that each of us have. But at first, they will follow their parents. They will talk like you. They will think like you. They will act like you. They will misbehave like you. They will have attitude like you. They learn from you, initially at least. So parents and You know, I think when we look at how to raise children or how to live our own lives, we have to deal with this sinful nature ourselves. We believe theologically this is what is the problem with our world, our lives. It is this nature of sin that we have such a hard time overcoming, right? And children as well. So to practice this, to put this into practice means, well, we believe what we, what we read in the Bible as, this is the word of God. This is the explanation of why things happened. The world is messed up because, well, yes, people are mean, but really it's about our sinful nature. We have a problem of our brokenness where we have greed and hate and, and that results in fighting and anger and, and you know, war and world wars. Right? It's the problem of our sin. It's our sinful nature. And the Bible gives us this 
we might say, insight into our life and why things happen the way they do. And so if you as a believer believe this is the word of God and this is why it's true, then you take this and you explore it and reflect on it and have Bible study and discuss this and begin to apply this in your lives. It becomes useful to you, as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, because it is God-breathed, because it is true. It becomes useful in teaching and training and correcting and rebuking. Uh, for those who believe, all right, um, I'm going to skip the third point and go to the fourth point. The Bible is enough. Um, second, or Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of the law. This is an interesting verse. I mean, I'm t- going to take it out of context today, but the secret things belong to the Lord. You know, there are things that what this is saying is that we will never understand. Or actually, in this context, what it's saying is that the Lord will never reveal. A secret is something that's not meant to be revealed. You tell someone a secret, they're not supposed to tell anybody. The Lord keeps his secrets to himself. God says, you know, there are things I'm not going to explain about the world to you, or maybe even about your life at this moment. Those are the secrets of the Lord. But it also says, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. There are things that God gives us and to our cho- that is meant for us and for our children that belong to us, that help us understand everything else. Um, my friend Anthony, I'll call him Anthony, he shares a common feeling of wanting more that the world is not enough. And I think we all can understand at different levels of what that means. So for him, he's a a wealthy person, and he's lived, my age, in a generation where he hasn't experienced war, right? At least, you know, what we call war, or going to war, and he's experienced prosperity. I think that kind of has defined America for the last, you know, since World War II, and for the most part. We've had some wars, but we have not had millions of people die during wars. Those are the world wars that have killed millions of people, um, even you know, in a in one country, even. So, the Bible says that God may not tell us everything that we want to know, but it does tell us everything that we need to know. The Bible may not be exhaustive in all truth, but it is enough. God has given to us what he wants to reveal to us. The secrets he holds himself, but what he's revealed, it is enough for us. Enough for our lives today, for your children, for all generations going forward. Now, when we, when we apply this, we say that Jesus is enough. And he is. The Bible talks in different ways that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough for salvation. Hebrews 10, 14, Acts 4, 12. Jesus is enough for our everyday life. Philippians 4, 19, Matthew 6, right? What the word of God gives us for life is enough. In Jesus who comes as the son of God, God himself, we find He is enough as well, not only for our salvation, but for everyday life. I would say two of these four friends in this group struggle with this, like the rest of us, right? Not that they they are the only one who struggles with this. But these are the things that are worth discussing for us as Christians as well. And this is what I want to encourage you to continue doing. I know you, you already do this, whether it's over lunch or in Bible study or or at some other time, is to reflect on the teachings of the Bible and what we are to take home. So today it might be, is the word of God enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you in this life? 
So I'll give you an example. I would say I'm very caught up, caught up in consumerism as much as anybody else in America. We just came back from a trip to, um, back to Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan. Um, consumerism as well as enjoying travel and all of that. So we went to these three different countries. We went to see some friends, and that was, you know, and it was just me and Priscilla without the kids this time. So we had our fun. So on this trip, we had a few, you could say, personal goals. We stopped in Japan for two days. It was an add-on to our trip. Um, and it turned into, we need to do two things, one thing each. For Priscilla, it was to go to Itoya. Some of you went there when, when you went in there on the trip. It's like eight floors. It's actually like 12 floors. Eight floors of craft, stationery, arts, goods, pens, you know, all of that good stuff. That's like Priscilla's heaven, Itoya. <laughs> so we went to Tokyo. One of our main goals was we're going to Itoya. So Priscilla went like, we were only there for like two days, and we, she went multiple times. <laughs> for me, um, I'm into backpacking, and there's this Japanese cult company called Mont Bell. Anybody heard of it? Not well known in the United States at all. They only have like two stores, and they're in Colorado. So they're just like REI, but they're high end, Patagonia, you know, North Face. And they make this down jacket that's a thousand fill. I don't see anybody getting excited about this, like I <laughs> like me. <laughs> Now, why is this important to me? <laughs> um, fill is basically how lofty down is, meaning you can have less of it and have the same warmth. Now, if you're just walking around town, no big deal. You can lug around a jacket that's heavy, and it doesn't need to be very high fill. It can just be low fill, and you know it's fine. It'll keep you the same warmth. But if you're hiking for like, 10 miles a day with like 30-something pounds on your back, you don't want to add extra ounces. I know it sounds silly, but ounces. It adds up, you know, 16 ounces, you know, and then becomes an extra pound, right? So this 1,000 filled jacket becomes the standard currently of like ultralight jackets. So my goal was to go and get this jacket for myself. Now, my reflection, as I already thought about this, and with you, as an example of how the Word of God needs to be discussed and reflected and among you know, a friends and among the church, are questions like, you could ask me, that I've already asked myself, do you really need another jacket? I mean, why are you buying this jacket? I can give you lots of reasons why I need this jacket, right? But it's good for conversation. It's good for, it's, it's useful for conversation among ourselves. Not to shame each other, not to judge each other. That's not really the point. The point for me is, well, you know, I mean, do I need this jacket? Could there be a better use for the money? Um, you know, is, is this touching an issue of my heart that I feel like maybe God can address better in re meeting this point of sense of I need this and I'm not satisfied? These are the conversations that we can have with each other. Um, and it's, again, it's not to judge or to shame or to say, oh, bad, bad decision. It's a point of reflection. The fruit of this, I believe, is that if you can have this reflection with yourself and with others from the Word of God, and is that it can really be life transforming. I would say I've had this conversation with myself thousands of times over many purchases and many bigger purchases in life regarding what is it that I'm living for? 
And what am I going to do with the money that God has given to us? And those are really the questions that, you know, it, it gets to, and I'll share with you more at the retreat, it gets to the bigger questions of life, not just like, okay, should I do this or should I do this on a daily basis, but really, what am I living for? What is really important? And so I think it's good to have these questions because what we believe about the Word of God is that not only is the Word of God and not only is it true, it is useful. Useful not to rebuke and shame you in that sense, but to gently rebuke each other, perhaps, you know, when it's needed. But it's useful for correcting and training and, and teaching and having these conversations with us in our everyday lives. Um, the Word of God for us is enough, right? And, it's, and, it, and it addresses our heartfelt needs needs of want and, you know, dis discontent, needs of desiring, needing hope and peace and joy and all these other things that I didn't talk about today. All right, the last is the Bible is eternal and um, that it's not a fad. Yeah, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, this seems very obvious to you, but... I think one of the things that most people believe in the world is this life is it, right? You only live once. And I'm just going to live, enjoy it as much as possible. But we have a bigger and longer perspective that this life is not it. There's more. There is in eternity. And the Bible gives us that. But we also believe what we also believe about the Bible is that the words of God it's not only relevant to Moses 3,500 years ago, but it's relevant to us today. That the Ten Commandments may be part of a covenant with the Old Testament and may be relevant for that period, but the Ten Commandments actually is still relevant for us today. Not as maybe ten laws as, okay, we need to put that in our United States you know, Constitution, but laws of God's heart that, or laws that God wants to put on our heart. Now, that to me is eternal. Um, i give you an example of, I think, what, how, what, we, what we go through in daily life. So on, on the plane to um, Singapore, I watched that movie that they made, what's it called, Dumb Money. It was about GameStop. <laughs> All right? Now, GameStop is a store that sells, like, um, what do they sell now? video games and stuff. All right. And so GameStop, um, it, uh, in the year 2000, it was below $1. It was a, you know, it was like they call it a penny stock at that point. It was below $1 in the year 2000. And then this guy started pumping up GameStop and selling how valuable it was. And then Elon Musk jumped into it at some point later as well. And so this stock went from a dollar to $483 at one point. And it was going crazy on January 28, 2021, right? And then some, um, some dark Wall Street hap things happened in the background, and this trading company called Robinhood stopped allowing it to be traded, and then it like crashed like 80% in like one day, right? Now, um, that is crazy, um, you know, to have $1 to $400 something, $8, right? But in some sense, um, it's not crazy because we live in that environment. In the last 30 years, all of us here have experienced, well, in some degree, the wealth of Silicon Valley early days of Intel, to even Yahoo, to Google, right, um, to Facebook and Meta. These are the companies that have brought tremendous wealth into this economy. And we are all either directly or indirectly benefit or live in that environment. 
And our world has become, I would say, this bubble that we live in in Silicon Valley. If you don't watch the news, if you never travel the world, and you don't see how most of the world lives, we live in this bubble of tremendous wealth. Um, to buy a Montbell jacket in Japan, in that perspective, is ridiculous. I mean, that's the kind of reflection I need to have, you know, and we need to have about how are we living in our lives. So the Bible is eternal, gives us a perspective that, well, yes, this life is not all that it is, um, but we are not to also live our lives as if you only live once, right? And we just go crazy. What the Bible gives us is actually an eternity saying that, you know, our relationships with people matter. Your relationships with each other, they, are, they will last forever. You will see each other in eternity. It matters what you say and do and act, behave with each other. And it matters that you care about family and neighbors and friends and coworkers. Their eternity is at stake as well. How you treat them, how you love them, how you are a witness to them whether you share the gospel with them or invite them to church or introduce them to someone else, these things have eternal consequences. Recently, um, I got a email from someone at, um, who is a friend, who has a friend at Cal State East Bay. So I'm serving some faculty there. And so I got an email and said, hey, this student I think from Malaysia, is attending Cal State East Bay. And I said, okay, I will con connect that friend with this other guy, um, Leon Harper, who is this legendary guy who's about to retire. He's been serving Cal State East Bay and graduate students for decades. He drives a bus, drives into Costco, drives them to get groceries, picks them up at the airport. Amazing guy. He goes to church out in that area. And I connected, I said, hey, Leon, get in this conversation. There's a person who is new. And, um, and, he, and he connected with them and brought them to church. Well, this friend had two friends who were unrelated to this email, but were also invited to this church. And then on, I heard through this thread, on New Year's Eve, this couple accepted Christ and became, became Christians at that New Year's Eve service. Now, for what that's worth, it could be eternity, right? These are the things that happen in daily life that have eternal significance. It was such a small thing for me to connect Leon to this person that, who I don't even know who got an email to the student who invited these other two friends to the service. Now, I'm certain that God was already working on these two people who accepted Christ. It's usually it's just not the first time they go to church and suddenly, yes, I believe, I accept Christ. But these are the things that God works mysteriously. He may not explain to us. But these are the things that matter and have eternal consequences for all of us in our daily life. And we believe that because the Bible tells us that our lives are eternal that what we do today matters in eternity. Now, for my friends who don't believe, um, who I brought up, and we, can, I, we continue to have conversations, I continue to try to invite them to church and, and, you know, and pray for them. Um, and, I, and I hope that they will come to follow Christ. But for all, those of us who believe, that if you believe that the word of God is true, then it becomes the app of all apps. What is an app? It is an application. And that's something that we as Christians need to be reminded, that the Bible is not just for head knowledge, but it is an application. It is useful. It is useful for our lives. And that's something that, as a church, we need to do together. On your own, yes, you study. On your own, you reflect in your life. But it is more useful and accelerated when you together as a group begin to discuss things like 
well, should I have bought that Mont Bell jacket? I have no regrets, actually. <laughs> and the reason is this, because of, I've had many conversations and reflections about this over the years, is because the end matters. And this is what I'll be talking about at the retreat. The end matters. We live our lives for a kingdom that is here but not yet, but a kingdom that is to come. And how we live our lives matter. And so regarding how we spend our money, it matters. We've decided, Priscilla and I, to give a lot to missionaries, friends basically who are missionaries, on a monthly basis over the last you know, 30 years of working. Um, we could have easily taken that money and bought cars, bigger houses, whatever, you know, taken many more trips, things like that. In the perspective of our, of our own lives, we've had some reflection at least about what are we living for and how are we going to, what, what does that look like and translate into daily life? And so, yeah, that was a big splurge for me um, to go to Japan and buy this. It was 50% off though compared to the U.S. price. But my reflection is, is that because I've reflected on this, that there are things that we do that we can enjoy, that God has given us to enjoy. But there is a greater thing that we're living for. And the Bible gives us that vision for life and that direction that we can take. That's useful because it is the word of God, because it is true. Let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for um, this morning we can come um, despite the, the difficult weather, the windiness, the even dangerous conditions. And thank you that we can worship together to fellowship, um, to reflect on your word, to allow you to transform us, to help us to become more like Christ in our thinking, in our daily life, to have um, true hope, to true peace, joy in our lives, uh, to know how we can even apply the Bible to, to make it useful to us in our daily life. Pray for a safe travels home for everyone. Um, we pray that you would uh, watch over everyone as, who is at home as well. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, if you stand, if you're able, let's respond to worship. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Oh, yeah.
above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever
Is treasured, Lord, your word is good. Lord, would that be the anthem of our lives now? That we would build our lives on the firm foundation of whatever you say. So, God, just reawaken our curiosity in this, Lord, to dive back into our Bibles, Lord, to preach the word of God to one another, Lord, to fellowship together, to be the church, Lord, to be the church to each other. And Lord, as you can pastor Eugene was saying, God, you are enough. God, you are more than enough. God, that you're good circumstance, Lord, that as the song goes, Lord, we are filled with your goodness, lost in your love. So meet us where we are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Pastor Eugene. And again, thank all of you for coming and I know we were all Californians here, so a little bit of rain. We were like, ah! But um, you guys are brave. Uh, thank you for coming. It shows that you really care, not just for your own self, but you matter to this church family. Uh, without the person next to you, it was, it was like, is anyone going to show up today? <laughs> are we all going to be on Zoom? <laughs> no, but you guys are great. Thank you so much for sacrificing, braving the wind and the rain to come and worship our God together. It really matters. It really means a lot. Um, so a few announcements before we close. The first is retreat. So you just saw our guest speaker for retreat, Pastor Eugene, and I think we got a taste a little bit of what we can expect, so that was really cool. Um, so retreat is happening April 5th through 7th. If you can sign up today, the deadline is next Sunday. So next Sunday is the deadline to sign up for retreat. But if you talk to me, I'll let you know. Um, so just know that the sooner you sign up, the easier it'll be on our end to regis get registration set up for everyone. Um, a little bit about retreat. The theme, um, as Pastor Eugene mentioned, is press on, press on. Um, and I think that is the perfect theme. One of our elders came up with that theme um, as we were meeting as a retreat um, com committee, team, as a retreat team. And it felt like a church that's on mission will sometimes hit roadblocks disappointments, grief, um, just being tired and weary. But collectively, if we have this spirit of press on, press on no matter what we face in life, that we can see God's kingdom here on earth, in our hearts and in the people that don't know him yet too. And so I really want us to start praying into this as a church, um, as a family, to start believing this already. 
um, so that God prepares our hearts for what he's going to deposit in this retreat. So press on. That's the theme of retreat. Um, all right, so that's enough for retreat. If you want to give um, to China Mission, we are still accepting donations for China Mission to Inner Mongolia to help the missionary that Serena introduced to us, who's friends with us now, sharing the gospel to unreached people groups in Inner Mongolia. Um, so if you feel led to give, God tugs on your heart, hey, I have this, what am I living for? Am I building up my own kingdom, building up my own comfort? Or do I want to help the missionary spread the gospel to those who need it? Here's an opportunity for you right in your face. You can give to China Missions. You can also give to the ministry of our church. Um, you can give online or you find Auntie Susie somewhere in the back. Um, uh, before we close, that's my kid. Yeah, before we close, uh, does anyone have any prayer requests? Um, I would like us to pray for retreat today, but if you have any other uh, prayer requests, um, yeah, Jackie. just pray in general for her because you're her friend but we want to join and support you um, in whatever way God's going to use you too so Lucy so um, I'll speak into the microphone for those online and those who couldn't hear Jackie has a kind of a friend she met randomly uh, at a your pharmacy <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> does that surprise anyone <laughs> no right <laughs> I can just imagine. Here's some cookies now. Um, so <laughs> Jackie's pharmacist um, has gotten to know Jackie, and we want to lift her up in prayer uh, because Jackie senses just a need, a prayer need, uh, getting to know her and her faith background, that maybe God's calling her deeper, calling her to a place of wonder and a place where maybe some of her questions can be addressed. So, um Anyone have any other prayer? Thanks for sharing, Jackie. Any other prayer requests? Other than that, um, I don't want to cut anyone else off for time, but also Auntie Susie is downstairs, I think. So, yeah, just... Yeah. What's her name? Can you feel? Okay. So into the microphone, um, Crystal's daughter, youngest daughter. Younger Sarah Shinik was going through a rough patch with some things. Let's just lift her up in general for prayer. Yeah. Let's have people surround Jackie and Crystal since they're the ones right there. Let's just lay hands. <laughs> just pray in agreement as I pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you hear our heart cry, that you know the burdens that are on, on our shoulders, and you say, come lay them down at the cross. And so collectively now, we want to be people that come together, that come bearing each other's burdens. God, we don't know any of these people that were mentioned, not personally, but God, we believe that you know them that their names were brought up today for a purpose, that nothing is an accident. And so, God, right now, we lay them down before you. Lucy, the pharmacist, that, God, there must be something you are doing in her life that we know about her right now. 
And so, God, in expectation, we pray that your spirit would break into her life, that there would be moments of divine encounter. We already know that you use Jackie so mightily, that her heart is so soft towards you that people seem to want to know her because they want to know you. So for the hunger that only you can satisfy, God, I pray that you would meet Lucy's needs, that you would bring her back into the fold, that you would answer her doubts, her questions, her struggles, that you would meet her in her family moments, God, even, and that you would anoint Jackie every time she goes to pick up whatever she needs, that those moments, God, be filled with your grace and your spirit of welcome, of prodigal son coming home. We pray, God, right now that not only would um, Lucy come to know you in a deeper way, but that Jackie would be blessed and filled with your spirit to overflow into her life. So, God, we just thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to pray and see and catch a glimpse that, God, you are working beyond the walls of our church. You are everywhere, God. And, God, we extend now to Crystal's family as well. Thank you so much for for bringing her into this family. And we want to support and surround her with the love and care that you've poured into our lives. We lift up her youngest, Shaniqua. We don't know what's going on right now. But, Lord, you know. You see her. You formed her. You know every single hair that's on her head. And you love her. And so, God, for whatever valley that she's walking in right now, we pray that she would know that her shepherd is with her, that the rod and the staff are there protecting and comforting and guiding her. So, God, order her steps. Be her hope. And, God, we just pray for breakthrough. We don't know exactly what that means, but, God, you know, and you know what is best for her. And so, God, we thank you again for the opportunity to know more of your heart, to expand, God, what you, what the picture of what you're doing in this world. It's not, we just, so many times we think, God's just doing something in my own little life. But God, you are working, you are alive, you are everywhere. And so, God, we proclaim this promise that, God, you will never leave or forsake, that you work all things for the good of those who trust. And so, God, we trust. We lay down our burdens before you. We ask that, God, you would provide breakthrough for Shaniqua, for Lucy, for anyone here who needs it. We trust in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, church. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. I, I, that's what it's about. So thank you so much. Um, let's all, uh, where do we go from there? All right, let's. Stand. I can feel the sun is coming out too. Let's stand. Let's stand and receive the benediction now. Let's stand and receive the benediction. Receive the benediction. God, we thank you for your word that is alive, living and active, sharper than any double edged sword. We pray that, God, your word would fill our hearts and our minds, that we would apply what we read. And that we would be able to share, God, and, and encourage and really apply the things that we read in your word to our everyday life. Because, God, we need it. Help us to see your word. Help us to see Jesus as enough this week. Send us out, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Go in peace. Ah.